Have you ever wondered what your dreams mean? Join us in Dream School at thisjunginlife.com and find out. Jung wrote, Dreams are a little hidden door in the innermost and most secret recesses of the soul. Dream School is a unique, self-paced online program you can start at any time that unlocks access to your inner world. Our 12-month program provides the support, knowledge, and guidance you need to reach within, decipher your personal dream code, and harness it to optimize your life. By enrolling, you'll join an affirming community of fellow travelers, each pursuing a unique quest. And it's fun. Join us on an adventure to wholeness and healing through understanding your dreams. Go to thisjungianlife.com and click on Dream School. You'll be taken to our secure checkout. Once you join, you'll get immediate access to our first three modules. You can get started right away. We look forward to seeing you there. Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst in Cape Cod. Today, we are going to talk about writing. And for all of you out there who think, oh, that doesn't apply to me, I don't do very much writing, um, let me set it in the context of Jungian psychology. It is a subset of creativity, which for Jung was one of our five instincts. And of course, we all write emails and thank you notes. Hopefully, we write down our dreams. We journal, and it is a way of relating to the unconscious and to shadow and discovering ourselves. With that in mind, that writing is the nodal point of a deeper process, uh, here we go. You know, Deb, th- that was a great way to introduce the topic. And I'm, I'm thinking about, you said it's a way of relating to the unconscious, which I think it very much is. And I imagine we'll be spending a lot of time there today. But you know, you said we write emails, which now we do in place of writing letters. But I'm thinking about how very, very important letter writing has been through the centuries. And Jung wrote just so many letters. So it's a way of relating to the unconscious. It's also a way of relating to each other. And I know I have you know, worked with many people who, when they have something serious to communicate, they really want to put it in writing. Mm-hmm. You know, So when they're having a conflict with their child or they want to confront their spouse, you know, it's like, well, I have to, I have to write it, you know, so it can be such an important way that we communicate with each other. And even, even texting is a form of writing, isn't it? It absolutely is. And I was thinking about writing letters in uh, days gone by, the correspondence between Jung and Freud. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have this sort of image of both of them at their desks at night, writing to the other, but also it's a communication between Mm -hmm. oneself and oneself. You have to stop, you have to think, what do I want to say? How do I want to say it? So it is a very rich process internally and relationally. It really crosses the threshold into a number of realms. There's also a whole, uh, some stuff that I've read lately about how uh, language and hand are connected neurologically. Uh, And I know for me, and I think for a lot of people, when I'm writing down a dream, for example, or writing an actual letter, I I cannot do it on a keyboard. I have to have that pen in my hand and a piece of paper. There's a lot uh, on the table right now, and all of it uh, is delicious, (laughs) <laughs> and I, uh, so I'm finding myself called back to that kind of 18th century art of the letter and thinking about how a part of your psyche was offered in the letter and translated into the 
keeping into the hands of the receiver. Seemingly, people experience that way, that the letter is a proxy for my presence to you, and particularly in environments where you might rarely see somebody who lived a fair distance away because travel was dangerous and travel was difficult. So the letter carries some part of the soul across kind of time and space. That's really great. It's really interesting. And it makes me think of this concept of logos, the word, and that it's the word that uh, creates. It's the word that structures. And it's the word that um, carries our, like you were saying, our, our soul. When we think about the Hebrew tradition, every letter was seen as a divine symbol. And things that were written in Hebrew would imbue the paper itself with a kind of life. And as the Torah was uh, reproduced again on a sanctified lambskin, I believe, that the Torah was believed to be literally alive by virtue of the sacredness mm -hmm. of the letters, ideas, and words, which goes to your uh, idea of logos and the power of logos to constellate soul even into an object. So really, we have just dived deep <laughs> yeah, we did. uh, into the into the archetypal realm and uh, how powerful the word on the page mm -hmm. uh, has always been even when today uh, we're tapping out an email to somebody else it has a tap root that reaches down in, yeah. in there yeah i want i want that's just so great you know even even while you're texting you know your spouse to remember to you know pick up some milk on the <laughs> way home or something it, it, there underneath that is this incredibly powerful thing of language and joseph that's that's so great that you brought up hebrew and it made me think of the story of odin mm who hung on the tree and sacrificed himself to himself and lost an eye to gain the runes, the written word. And so, so, so the written language is just so incredibly powerful and it is with us all throughout our days in ways we often don't even think about. It is a symbol system. Letters and words and sentences are intricate cultural symbols that we have agreed kind of have the same meaning and can carry us and our ideas far beyond us. And that process of creating the symbol of the word is also therapeutic. We often encourage our clients to journal their feelings. And across the board, People say that if I sit down and write a page about being angry at my boss or any number of things, that it engages the self-regulatory part of the brain, and it has a calming effect on the amygdala, which is the revving up part of the brain. So capturing feeling and circumstance in words also takes it a little bit out of ourselves and stores it in the paper or the clay tablet or the papyra mm -hmm. or your computer, mm -hmm. leaving the ego in a much more objective and less complex state. I really like that of how we render something, uh, a feeling, uh, by putting it into words and the physicality of using our hands and getting our bodies into it, uh, whether it's a keyboard or a pen or pencil, that there is something really integrative about the act of writing itself and what else can be brought into consciousness. I'm thinking about writing down a dream. And I bet everybody has had this experience of I sit down, I start to write the dream, and then halfway through that, I remember, oh, I forgot the part about, and I put that in. Or when I'm trying to describe something, 
uh, I will say something like, and I think there were uh, three trees uh, that were just starting to bud out. So more detail rises to the surface as we take the time to render something from the unconscious into the written word. So I, I think that's that's great, Deb, and, and I think what we're saying really is that writing is about formulating. Hmm. So I think a lot of times we feel something percolating around. It might be in our bodies. We feel a vague sense of unease. Perhaps there's some pressure or some discomfort. That is a, a feeling that's arising in our our bodies and it's it's kind of a a right brained experience it's something we know but we don't have a way to formulate it yet and when we start writing that unformulated wisdom gets translated into language and it's kind of that goes from sort of a, a left brain sorry i'm sorry right brain process it kind of gets transferred over to the left brain and then to our right hand if we're right handed then we write it down and then we've captured it and we have a relationship with it and we can think about it it's very difficult to think about things that aren't formulated yet and talking helps formulating things which is which is why analysis works it's one of the key <laughs> things but writing, maybe even more so, and that's why journaling is so powerful, like what you were talking about, Joseph. I want to bring up a little uh, vignette of some research I remember reading about where researchers flashed faces uh, with different expressions across the screen and noticed what happened to people's arousal. And when people saw an angry face or a scared face, there would be a level of arousal. When the researchers followed the angry or, or fearful face with the word anger or fear, the, the arousal went down, even though it flashed across the screen so quickly that people didn't consciously register it. Mm. So there is a way that language is profoundly containing. Once we have words for something, then we have it instead of it having us. Mm -hmm. And writing is such an integrator, it's such an integrative process. You know, you, you might remember this from your student days that you had to read Huck Finn or something in English class, and then you had to write a paper on it. <sighs> and if you really gave yourself to that process, boy, you understood the book so much better after you wrote the paper. It really was about the process. I mean, hopefully mm -hmm. your paper was good too. But trying to put your thoughts into words and on the page or on the computer screen, you know, really um, shifts your degree of understanding. This has um, connected me with a memory from my uh, years, oh my goodness, so many years ago, as a special ed teacher working with adolescents at the high school level. And um, I was the, the English language arts person. My rule was everybody wrote every day. Everybody had a journal and you could write anything you wanted, anything at all. So I had kids who would write, um, you know, a whole page of the same four letter word over and over and over again. You know, obviously, obviously to challenge me, well, you know, Miss Stu, you said I, we could write anything. So here you go. <laughs> but, uh, and I would write back, uh, every day, just a sentence or two, maybe. But what I noticed over time was it was impossible for even the most recalcitrant student to keep writing nothing. Something wanted to come into being. Yeah. Something yeah. wanted to be said. Something wanted to be lifted into uh, more of a real communication. And uh, so I'm thinking about you and the, the book report for Huck Finn of, yes, something if we give ourselves to it, will give itself to us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Deb, uh, I was clearly one of your students, <laughs> although you didn't know it. <laughs> Gosh, I just don't remember you there at all, Joseph. <laughs> so it's third grade, and I'm in Mrs. Ellison's class, and she was this extraordinarily witchy woman, apparently just on the verge of retiring. <laughs> she was 
She yelled a lot. She was pounding on her desk a lot. She was just a really big, angry person. Oh, God. So about halfway through the year, we would get the kind of the vocabulary list. You know, this is the words you need to learn. And then you'd have to write a sentence to demonstrate that you had some learning. So I got the fine idea in my head that I was going to work Mrs. Ellison into the all of the sentences. <laughs> so like the word the word was fat. So I wrote, Mrs. Ellison is fat. Or the word was stupid. Mrs. Ellison is very stupid. And so it went down, like criticizing her through the list. And I remember like one of my buddies is sitting next to you, even in third grade, and he's looking at the list. And he looks at me and he goes, what are you doing? <laughs> and I just said, oh, it'll be fine. I'm doing the exercise. Oh, God. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and handed it in. How'd that work for you, Joseph? <laughs> um, it, you know, to her credit, it could have gone a lot of different ways. <laughs> so I think it might have been the next day. Mrs. Ellison says, oh, oh, Joey, uh, I'm driving you home today. <laughs> So, of course, that's bizarre and horrifying. So, and, of course, no one would do that nowadays. But anyway, so I'm in the car and we drive back to the house. And uh, Mrs. Ellison has a meeting with my mom. Uh. And, uh, you know, I'm kind of banished into my room. And uh, then Mrs. Ellison leaves. And years, many years later, my mother talked about that conversation. And apparently... Uh, Mrs. Ellison showed my mom the paper and just laughed maniacally <laughs> <laughs> uh, for like five minutes. And she says, I have never experienced a kid going after me like this. I don't even know what to do. So she and my mother laughed, thought it was hilarious, and also thought, this cannot continue. <laughs> so, yes, I, I was one of your students. <laughs> Uh, your, your so you early... did you did a fine job on using the vocabulary words in a sentence and then uh, the next stage would have been to <laughs> kind of work on your sense of what is socially relevant and uh, interpersonally strategic. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> it was not a pro-social behavior. <laughs> but it was, to be honest, it was a way that I could could take an internal experience of feeling outraged yes. by this um, mm -hmm. teacher's short-tempered verbal aggression. And it was powerful for me to be able to say to her in what I thought was an encoded way <laughs> that I <laughs> Subtlety <laughs> has never been your strong suit. <laughs> no, it's really not. Um, to communicate that I felt incredibly angry and outraged at her behavior and that my mom also got a chance to read that, although they thought it was funny, the message did get out. And as a kind of automatic writing, actually, you know, I had no sense of consequences. So we're in the realm of writing as protest. Writing as protest. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking of graffiti, actually, and, mm. and how there's something really kind of moving about going to visit Rome and seeing, mm -hmm. you know, graffiti from 2000 years ago, scrawled into the walls, you know, people, people airing their political gripes 2000 years ago in this anonymous way of, of writing. So it can be, you know, it's sort of the message in the bottle sort of thing. You know, when, when we're being impinged upon in some way that we can deliver a message through through writing and and feel uh, it's a way of claiming agency. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and aggression. And aggression. Mm -hmm. um, I remember some years back we had an occasion to go to Switzerland and there was, you know, here is this nice, tidy, polite, ultra clean, fabulous city uh, of Zurich. And there was graffiti all over the place. Whenever we got on the train, you could see it as we went by buildings. And I thought, oh, my goodness, uh, here is the compensatory function for the trains that are on time to the second. And uh, everything uh, so tidy and well-organized. And then there is all this graffiti. Yeah. 
Yeah. So writing as purchase is a good thing. Just don't do it like Joey. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Or maybe you should. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I want to pivot a little bit and talking about writing as a kind of metabolizing. Mm -hmm. That to write something also makes it real. It takes something that is impressionistic something that's an image, whether it's sensory, uh, visual, emotional, and adds thought, which alchemically would be mercury, adds mercury into the prima materia of the experience. And there's a dissolving effect, which I think many of us feel. For me, writing is very, very difficult. So while I can acknowledge the prima materia of my experience, when I add the mercurial element of my conscious life, it turns into a kind of solution. And, and for me, I can get really trapped in the solution of that, which can turn into a writer's block, which I can be trapped in for long periods of time. What's such a relief is when the mercury is finally driven off through heat and the new product appears in the alchemical vessel as the idea, as the language, as the sentence structure. So when we ask our clients to write a little bit, we're also asking them to go into an alchemical process of breaking down, organizing, submitting to a bit of confusion as things boil around inside, and then to find a product which is valuable in the midst of the prima materia. And I'm thinking of your book, Lisa, as you're writing about the prima materia of these intense feeling states, kinesthetic states, the actions uh, and life of being a mom, and taking all of that and subjecting it to the mercury of your mind and then creating this artistic product, which we would call a book. Yeah, um, I, I really appreciate that description, Joseph. And I, I think that, um, that that's a great way to describe the process. Yeah, you, you laid out so much there. I'm I'm thinking about your your difficulty with writing and that was making me think about my own experience. I I wonder if we're all just sort of wired somewhat differently because it's more painful for me to try to access my thinking function when I'm speaking. But when I'm writing, I'm not saying that it's easy, but it is easier for me to access my best self thinking function when I've got a metaphorical pen in my hand. Whereas I think for you, it's so easy for you to access this incredible intuitive capacity that you have with the spoken word. You know, it's always sort of amazing to me, but I'm, I'm much more likely to, to, to think, wow, I really landed on something there when I'm writing than when I'm speaking, which is not really great for podcasting, but there you go. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, it, it, I mean, I obviously was gestating the book for a really long time and wrote many different drafts of it and was writing it throughout living through these experiences. So I first started thinking about it when my kids were very, when I, you know, basically my daughter was two and my son was a newborn. And I didn't really start writing about it in a formal way for a couple of years after that, although I was reading and thinking about it. But I wrote about it first. Uh, when they were like, I think like five and seven, and then kept writing about it and was, you know, drafting actually up until last year, you know, and now they're 16 and 18. So I kind of lived through all these experiences with them while I was writing about it. And, you know, recently my, my daughter went to college and, you know, I, I'd always wondered what that transition was going to be like. And, you know, it's not that it hasn't felt momentous in many, many ways, but I have not felt really rocked by it 
as I sometimes thought I might. And I think it's partly because I did so much metabolizing of my experience of being a mother through the writing. And the timing has been so kind of fortuitous in a way that I've sort of finished up the book while I'm sort of finishing up this active part of motherhood. And it, and it feels very well digested. And I think that's largely because of the writing. I'm aware, though, too, Lisa, that you committed yourself to this process for at least as long as 10 years. You know, just as a practical matter, you sat down in front of the screen and just worked it. That there, there was time and intention and, and the commitment. And uh, you know, I'm thinking about that famous uh, Goethe quote that I think is so relevant for, for any creative process where uh, he says, until one is committed, there is hesitancy, the chance to draw back always in effectiveness. There is an elementary truth, the ignorance of which kills countless ideas and splendid plans that the moment one definitely commits oneself, then providence does too. Mm. Uh, and then he, the quote ends with, whatever you can do or dream you can, begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. And I think that you you did that. The commitment mm. um, is a slightly different quality. It could be for someone who is an artist or a musician or a cook or a gardener. Mm -hmm. Putting in the time... Mm -hmm. You know, and writers talk about facing the blank screen or or facing the page. Yeah. A and that is a sort of substrata, I think, of the actual writing of uh, even with my high school students of so just sit there and make your hand move on the page. Mm -hmm. You know, in some way, the writing itself wasn't that hard. And, and I, I can talk about that in just a second. But but. I appreciate that quote so much, Deb. I don't think I'd ever heard the whole, whole thing. One of the things that happened to me early on, well, not that early on, when I wanted to do this, I took in, you know, some of what was, because it's not, it's not just the writing, right? It's like the selling. That's, that's actually a really not such an easy thing to do. It's almost easier to write it than to, you know, <laughs> find someone who was willing to publish it. But, um, you know, ever grateful to my, my wonderful agent, Adriana Stimola and uh, Sounds True, who've just been lovely. At some point, I was reading about what it takes to be able to sell a nonfiction book. And someone, it was probably just a blog online or something, someone said, if you're, if you're thinking of writing a book, you believe you have something to say. And I kind of recoiled at that. I thought, do, do I actually think I have something to say? And I thought that was difficult to own, that I felt like I had something to say. And it brings up this, this truth that when we want to undertake any kind of creative project of any magnitude, we need a tiny bit of inflation and a little bit of healthy narcissism. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm, I think I can claim this space. I think I deserve to claim this space. I think not only can I do the hard work, and, and there was lots of hard work, but it's easy. In some sense, if you've got a certain personality, it's easy to work hard. Like working hard is, is fine. But that other thing of saying, yeah, I'm going to work hard, and I'm going to dare to say, and I think I have something to say. You know, that that is a difficult moment, I think, for some people who are reaching for publication in writing, let's say, mm -hmm. or even a blog. You know, it's like, I have something that I think other people want to read. I'm taking it back uh, to, you know, early beginnings and to what Joseph, what you said about sitting and writing translates things, as it were, from the amygdala, from our emotions to the word, to consciousness, and that we all have something to say. But we get a lot of us talked out of the legitimacy of our feelings early on. 
And Joseph, your hilarious tale of your vocabulary uh, exercise about your teacher was a great exercise in that, that you had something to say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and you claimed it. So I'm just thinking about broadening that base of writing. We all have something to say. Yeah, yeah. And, and I appreciate your both, you know, kind of illustrating that it is legitimate. Whatever you have to say, like the Goethe quote, say it. You have entitlement. You have the right to put your feelings into words. And woven into that, is the preserving power of putting things into word. And when we think about this kind of cultural phenomena of going from a society that was primarily language-based, that all the wisdom of the tribe was held through storytelling and passed down verbally generation after generation, as it was you know, throughout ancient times, and then the invention of symbols to represent these uh, verbal sayings that were in the realm of alchemical salt. So you dissolve salt into water, but as the water evaporates, it recrystallizes. So there's something about the form-making capacity of salt, but salt is also a preservative. So um, salt pork salted anything, salted mm. fish. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was the primary way that people kept food from spoiling. When we think about the incredible impact it has had on modern culture to discover the Rosetta Stone, to discover the scrolls at Nag Hammadi, and to translate the papyra, this incredible demonstration of the ancient society and the ancient psyche which is preserved forward. Mm. Oh, that's just beautiful. I, I really, there's something so moving to me about reading something that's very, very ancient and finding myself in it. And you're right. It is, it is a way of preserving soul writing is, I think, mm -hmm. more than anything. And I mean, I, I grew up loving to read. And, and I think the thing that, that, captured me most about reading. You know, when I, when I was in high school, I read a lot of, I actually never read Huck Finn. Please do not tell my 11th grade English teacher that because, <laughs> because I really, really was into Dostoevsky at the time. So I, I was like, I don't, I don't really want to read Mark Twain. I want to read this. But what, but what captured me, for example, about reading Dostoevsky, here's somebody who lived, you know, across the other side of the world you know, a uh, hundred more years from when I was, you know, reading, totally different culture, totally different language. And, and I could be with, with his soul and, and he with mine is how it felt. You know, it did feel like a meeting across time and space. And, you know, I, I remember reading uh, Augustine's Confessions in, for a college like survey course of European history, Augustine's Confessions and the Letters of Abelard and Eloise. Oh, uh, those books made so such an impression on me for just exactly this thing that you're talking about, Joseph. That um, and that's what made me decide to be a a history major. I thought, wow, look at look at that, look at the soul of these people. I don't think I I don't necessarily know that I thought about it in that language, but that I felt connected. You know, C.S. Lewis, I think, once said, we read to know we are not alone. I think that that's really, that's really it. The idea of you having a kind of psychic affair with Dostoevsky in high school <laughs> is really spicy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it was, it was always between him and Leo Tolstoy. Oh, yeah. Tolstoy. <laughs> mm. I'm thinking about... Um, how ambivalent and ambiguous <laughs> the whole process uh, of writing is. Uh, and maybe reading, too, you know, that you knew you didn't want to read Mark Twain and you did want to read Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. Never read Huck to this day. Ah, uh, and, and now all our listeners know that. Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness, yep. such a disclosure. Uh, but I, I'm thinking about 
for myself, the process of writing and the, and the written word as a deep dive sometimes uh, into the unconscious. Sometimes it's not a big deal. It's an email or even a text message. But I'm thinking about uh, back when, because I came from a family that valued this, I would have to write letters to certain relatives, and I knew that they expected some kind of a thoughtful uh, communication. <laughs> and I would take the time, uh, kind of really get my pen out, think about what, sh what should I say to this particularly uh, erudite uncle, uh, and how should I phrase it so that I would appear uh, like, like a sophisticated, <laughs> uh, capable niece. And I'm thinking about you talking about writer's block, Joseph, of that there really is a lot of ambivalence, I think, about writing. And uh, is what I want to say findable? Is it retrievable? Will the words be there? How will it be received? Writing is a real encounter with the unconscious. It's so painful. It's so painful. There's this famous quote that I, I don't know that anyone knows who says it's been variously attributed to a bunch of, to a bunch of different people, but it's such a great quote. He said, the quote is, writing is easy. You just open a vein and bleed. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I can totally relate to that. It's like sometimes I sit down, I'm like, okay, I'm going to write this thing. And maybe it's just like a couple paragraphs. And I just sit there and I'm like, maybe I'll actually check Twitter. <laughs> This is like, ah, you know, it is that it is that process of um, taking the prima materia and mm, finding wrestling with it to find to find just the right word. And when it works, it feels really good when I'm when I'm writing and, it, and it's going well. It is a, I get a physical sensation throughout my body that is uh, just uh, really pleasant. It just kind of feels uh, uh, awake and alive and kind of calm. And it, it, it's interesting to me that it, it manifests so physically. Um, but, but it's difficult to get there. It is, it is painful. I think we do often feel ambivalent about it, especially when we've got some large piece of writing to do. Now, Rollo May touches on some of that, and I would recommend the book to our listeners called the, the Courage to Create. And it's just a series of short essays. It's not a laborious read. But he says that anxiety and self-doubt are unavoidable aspects of the creative process, that creativity requires courage, and that the unconscious chaos in us feeds the creative impulse and that creativity requires a kind of deconstruction or destruction. And so I, I'm imagining that those are many dynamics to it, but I wanted to speak about the destructive aspect, that if we are in an extremely stable and monotonous internal state, that that's not terribly conducive to creatively writing. But the writer has to own that they are destroying something in order to create. And when I'm thinking of your book, Lisa, as you had started talking about it, there is a kind of myth about the mother and how she should be and what that all means. And to write your book, which attempts to deconstruct, to blow up this cultural fantasy and replace it with a much more psychologically sophisticated image and understanding, and relating that to antiquity through the fairy tales, that's part of what creativity involves. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. I, I don't know that I had ever thought about it just that way, but I think you're 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 right about that it it there's a kind of given that we come into the that we just go about our day with on any number of topics right we just we think well this is just what it is and when when we read a really good novel for example it's not because it just reiterates 
what we thought we already knew about some situation or experience. It's because it really, as you're saying, kind of destroys that and gives us a new experience with fresh eyes. And that that is very much what I was hoping to do uh, with motherhood. I mean, I for one thing, m- my book is really not about how to parent. It's about the psychological growth that one experiences as a result of parenting. And by the way, you know, just for clarification, it's not that I believe that the only way one can grow psychologically is to have children. But I was interested in exploring that because I don't know that that has been talked about much and certainly not from a Jungian frame. So I wanted to destroy this idea in a, to use your formulation, Joseph, which I'm, I'm appreciating, that motherhood is just about sort of doing a good job being a mother, or it's about wrestling even with how difficult it is. And there are some very good books about that. But it's about, and look at the psychological growth that occurs as a result of this. And through creating space after the dissolution of someone's two-dimensional idea about motherhood, something rises which is more actualized and offers a model where mothers, particularly even new mothers, can inhabit in their imaginations more fully. And, And I think that that prepares the field for more to be allowed without having to battle itself forward. And that's Mm -hmm. so much, I think, of of Jung's psychology. We create a map of something, and when the ego inhabits the map, it already has a certain strength to encounter the possibility, at least, of other aspects of self that we might not have had language to name or permission even to know about. Right. It's the ordering power of language that does create these opportunities to meet other parts of ourselves. I mean, I know that that was very much true for me when I found Jung, you know, very quickly just being introduced to the language of Jungian psychology gave me a new way to relate to myself. And, you know, it is my hope that my book will do that for mothers too. And certainly not just for for new mothers, but mothers anywhere in the process, because it really kind of spans, you know, all the way up to having adult children, maybe opens up, provides la- new language for a way to think about that. And interestingly, the existentialists often say that reality is contained in language. So only when a certain language enters the culture, does the collective uh, fill that language does add it to the sense of reality of what is included in the canon of human experience. I'm thinking about um, how how we're really starting to describe the creative process in motherhood or writing or a, a number of other things and how it demands the descent Mm-hmm. into the prima materia, into the chaos, into the unconscious, and that then we can render it into something new, something that has words, something that has conscious comprehension. And so I'm thinking your process is, uh, is a twofer here. Uh, first, you descended into the realm of motherhood, and then into uh, writing and rendering it into words. I appreciate the advance copy of the book. And just so all our listeners out there know, it is fantastic. <laughs> it's readable, conversational, human, mythical. Uh, you won't be able to put it down. Oh, well, thank you, Deb. As you know, you were... Your fingerprints are all wow. over it. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't see very many of them at all. Um, and it's yours. You claim it. And I'm thinking I want to really encourage everybody out there uh, to engage this part of of self. We talk about dreams, and we talk about writing dreams down, and 
I think I want to reach into uh, journaling because uh, words and uh, that process of translating unconscious material into consciousness, it's available to everybody. Mm -hmm. It's out there. All you need is a piece of paper and a pencil. You know, you're talking about the creative process, and I'll just share quickly that mine was fairly plotting. And it may be the nature of a, a nonfiction book as opposed to a fiction book, which arguably is a little different. But I was trying to parent and have a practice and do all this other stuff while I was writing the book. So someone had tasked me with writing 300 words a day. And that that's a maybe two or three paragraphs, and it, it takes maybe 20 or 30 minutes. And so I, I did. And really, I wrote most of the book 20 or 30 minutes. Uh, chunks uh, just every day. And what I what I liked about that is I would have an idea about what I wanted to say, and I could say it in about 300 words. And then I was usually like, I don't know what the hell needs to come next. But it was fine because I was done. Mm -hmm. And then I would, you know, go get in the shower or whatever. And of course, when you're in the shower, you, you get ideas it's like, oh, <laughs> I need to write about that next. So it was like the unconscious would come forward and meet me. I would come with a little offering every morning of my 300 words. And then the unconscious would come and meet me and give me a little more. And so at the next day, I would often, you know, make a note throughout the day of oh, this, this, and this. The next day I would write that little bit. And then the unconscious would come back and meet me. It reminds me a little bit of the elves and the shoemaker. Mm. That if you remember that fairy tale, the shoemaker was, um, was, he was going bankrupt. He was going out of business. He had, he had enough leather for one pair of shoes. So he, he worked hard, right? He, he cut, he did the, what he needed to do to cut out the shoes and he left the leather sitting out at night. And overnight the elves came and they made this beautiful pair of shoes that was so beautiful that he was able to sell them for enough for food and for the leather for two more pairs of shoes. So it's like if you work hard, then the unconscious comes forward and brings you the magic, you know, and that that's very much what it was like for me. But, you know, sometimes writing is a lot more tumultuous and we can really be swept into the unconscious. And I'm wondering if we can make a shift and talk about that. I mean, Jung had an important story about that too. Jung wrote a lot about automatic writing. Jung was trained in hypnosis like all of the early psychoanalysts were. And that was one of the ways that they were exploring the concept of the unconscious. They were particularly interested in therapeutic applications. So neurotic patients would come and they would lose the use of a hand or be unable to see out of one of their eyes. And after examination, it was clear that it was a deep, profound psychological splitting was happening. And what early psychoanalysts discovered is if they would put people into a hypnotic trance and rest back down into the unconscious, all of a sudden the hand would work, the eye could see, uh, they could speak and have access to inner contents that the ego state would not permit. One of the things that he was interested around hypnotic trances was the idea of automatic writing. Given that the ego has integrated language adequately and writing adequately, that one could let the ego drift down and down and down, and that something else, the inner other, could grab hold and create legible sentences and often introduce profound ideas. Jung's Seven Sermons was one of these extraordinary kind of automatic writings, apparently. And also, automatic writing can have or carry a certain authority and a certain kind of ancient use of language. Yeah, because it really kind of comes from the depths of the objective psyche, in a way. And I'm thinking, Deb, that you've had uh, some experience of just the unconscious taking you and pages flowing out of you. 
I think that the delving into the unconscious has so many facets to it. And as you were talking, I was thinking about Coleridge, who wrote, you know, uh, in Xanadu was Kubla Khan, and he was apparently, you know, in an altered state when he wrote it and was interrupted and the poem was never finished. And how much of that is um, kind of urban myth and how much of that is really real, I don't know. And I remember many, many years ago, um, I dived into a creative writing project and I had uh, committed to writing a certain number of pages by a certain deadline, even though it was just personal writing, it wasn't anything that I was going to put out there. And I was wafted into a state that felt like being enchanted by the fairies. Uh, I was in the Magic Mountain, and the fairies were dancing, and I was writing, and I cranked out uh, some huge number of pages, and it was incredibly enchanting and exciting. And when I came to, I really was both awestruck and scared. Mm. And I didn't touch that project again, period, because the connection between my conscious state so many years ago and diving deep into the unconscious, my conscious state couldn't really sustain it and stay present uh, without feeling kind of possessed, mm -hmm. even though it was a kind of magical experience. I'm kind of liking your process, Lisa. Uh, <laughs> it sounds so uh, scary, doesn't it? Uh, no, it sounds like 300 words a day and that the elves will come and that they will, will help you. Uh, but I think I just wanted to touch on how to manage uh, the depth of the descent into the unconscious, as well as the difficulty of going there in the first place. Yeah, and I, if I, if I may, can I read a little bit about Jung's process writing Septum Sermones? I mean, he he writes about it in uh, Memory Streams Reflections. I'm going to read um, what Barbara Hanna writes about it, and she it's informed by what he wrote too. So it was 1916, and these um, kind of paranormal experiences started taking place in Jung's house in Kuznacht. Blankets were suddenly snatched away. One of his daughters saw a white figure passing through her room, and so on. The series culminated one Sunday afternoon when the whole family and the two maids heard the front doorbell ringing frantically. Jung not only heard it, but saw the bell moving. It's a huge bell, right, Deb? You and I saw that when we were at his house. Um, but although they investigated while the bell was still ringing violently, there was no one there. No longer able to stand the impossibly thick atmosphere of the house felt by everyone in it, Jung went to his study and allowed the unconscious to express itself through his pen. In three evenings, the strange document Septum Sermones Ad Mortuos was produced. He said, as soon as I took up the pen, the whole ghostly assemblage evaporated. The room quieted and the atmosphere cleared. The haunting was over. Mm. So he need, something needed to come through him, and it needed to come through his pen. I mean, it must have been frightening, just as your experience was, Deb. I think so, and that was a difficult time in Jung's life. So overall, you know, we are talking about what I think is sort of the bottom line of, of Jungian work, but it extends throughout life and human experience, which is what and how is our relationship with the unconscious? And that writing can be a ritual that evokes and contains so many different aspects of psyche. Yeah. Mm -hmm. From powerful unconscious forces to organizing our life experiences to regulating our emotions to extending our psyche with some permanence to another mm -hmm. person. Yeah. With, to preserving what's important to us mm -hmm. and and writing can carry that and many other things undoubtedly yeah yeah and you're reading that uh, excerpt about Jung from Barbara Hanna's book really shows uh, that the unconscious is going to have an effect on us it will influence us whether we want it to or not and 
our choice is only what kind of relationship we are going to have with it, of how to engage it. Because if we don't engage it, it will nevertheless engage us. <laughs> well, with that sober comment, let's transition into a dream. Hi, this is Joseph from this Jungian Life podcast. Lisa, Deb, and I have been deeply moved by your responses to our work. Producing, editing, and distributing it involves substantial expenses, and now we need your help. Please stop by our website, thisjungianlife.com, and click on the heading, Be Our Patron. You'll be redirected to our Patreon funding page. Patreon helps creators connect with people who believe in projects like ours. There, you can sign up with your credit card to support us with as little as a dollar a month. And at higher levels of support, we'll provide special episodes, behind-the-scenes photos and stories, and a chance to join a select pool of listeners for dream interpretations. Thank you. Today's dream is from a 39-year-old woman who is an artist and a psychology student. And she says, I was attending a house party and I was in the kitchen. I was wearing a skirt and all of a sudden I realized had pooped without realizing it. And the poop was on the floor of the kitchen. It was like a long light beige dinner roll in its size and shape. And there were large batteries in the poop. I quickly picked it up, hoping no one saw me, and turned to put it in the toilet. But there was someone in the bathroom, so I wrapped the poop in a yellow garbage bag and dropped it in the garbage can. At some other point in the dream, I had to collect many things I had strewn about in the house because I had to leave to make a train journey. I often have elements of my dream where I'm hustling to get somewhere to be on time for a leaving train or bus, but I can't find my belongings. At another point, I was in a van with many people driving along a bumpy dirt road. For the majority of the dream, I was surrounded by people, but feeling alone. And for context, she says, I'm currently working on paying better attention to my appetite and trying to eat more intuitively instead of eating when I think I should eat and what I cognitively determine to be the right foods and the right quantities. Put another way, I'm trying to become more attuned to what my body actually needs and is telling me it wants in terms of nutrition and eating. Also, I'm in the process of a slow and steady career change from being an educator who works mostly with young children to engaging myself in academic psychology history research. I'm very excited about this shift, but I also sometimes feel insecure about approaching new fields of interest with a long way to discover and being 39, which sometimes I judge in myself as being too old. And feelings in the dream were hurry, embarrassment, surprise, there's not enough time and not enough space, a feeling that I can't tell anyone what's going on, the poop must be hidden. And for additional context, she says, I've had a lot of intestinal stress and discomfort in the last little while, coupled with an anxious fixation on these discomforts, so lately I've been trying to be more curious than paranoid. Well, the first place that I find myself going is to alchemy, not surprisingly. The ancient alchemists were profoundly driven by the feeling, the intuition, that there was something secret and highly valuable which could be found in the most foul of substances. On one level, it has to do with that emerging doctrine of polarities, pairs of opposites that Jung writes extensively about. It's also part of an ancient Greek dictum that when a certain thing goes to its most extreme, it is right on the verge of becoming its opposite. Mm. So, Metallurgically, the alchemists would take lead, which was a very common substance, extremely common substance in uh, European landscapes. It was used in lots of different ways, some <laughs> not to the benefit of people, like adding it to wine to improve its flavor, but um, 
There was a sense because of the weight and the malleability of lead that it must be just a hair's breadth away from becoming gold. So the chemists would work and work and work to try to get this most common of substances to become the most wonderful of substances. But particularly the early European alchemists were very interested in feces and they would experiment with feces trying to unleash the secret elixir of life. And of course, literalizing that made many of them quite ill. But the idea that there's something that is passing out of me that I cannot metabolize, but is full of life and And energy energy and possibility. And that she feels ashamed when it accidentally poops out in the middle of a party. So when I think about all the things that I've accidentally said, um, (laughs) you know, after one martini or something like that, all of the great pearls of wisdom wrapped in poop (laughs) just blot out of me. Um, I can identify on a feeling level of the ambivalence about having the unconscious express, you know, in the middle of a party like that. Yeah, that's a great, uh, I love how you just unwrapped that. That's, Mm -hmm. that's, you know, that is sort of the central image and there's the shame. And so the poop won't, it can't go in the toilet. So she has to put it, she has to hide it and kind of Mm -hmm. surreptitiously put it in the trash. I'm back on uh, your idea here, Joseph, of, uh, you know, where is the gold in the lead or in the in the poop that it has batteries in it, <laughs> which, uh, you know, it looks like a dinner roll. But I like the image of the batteries, that there's energy here. So the dream ego says, oh, God, this is awful, you know, and that is so typical of dreams like this that people have over and over and over again, that, you know, there's something, uh, urine and feces, uh, the dream ego is embarrassed and ashamed and so on, versus, oh, this one, this has batteries in it, there's energy in it. So the dream ego hides it. Well, and, and just, here's an intuition that's coming up for me. She talks about feeling insecure, excited, but also insecure and worried that she's being, that she's too old. And uh, it's like, as you, as you put so well, Joseph, something of real value has passed through her and out of her and she can't really value it and feels like she wants to throw it away. And so it's almost like she can't really inhabit that thing that wants to come through her into the world. She feels too much shame about it. She feels like she's too old or she's not going to be good enough in this new field, but it has energy. She's excited about it. So I think that the image may relate to her experience of uncertainty at this threshold and and needing to kind of step into these larger shoes and really claim this. Piggybacking on that, I think about the batteries as being the undigested, the unassimilable content, which she is taking in, but the psychic body has not figured out a way to metabolize, to integrate it into the subtle body, to integrate it into her conscious life. And so it's excreted out. So this is also a really interesting biological metaphor. And Jung was also interested as a physician in the diagnostic potential of dreams. So when we eat food, we kind of chew it up in our mouths, hopefully well, goes down into the stomach and a bunch of enzymes and all these different things are added to break it into its component parts. And then it moves down into the small intestines as a kind of sluice. And that sluice is called chyle, uh, C-H-Y-L-E, I believe. And this sluice, which has all this potential for the body, as it moves through the small intestine, 
these tiny little finger-like cilia? substances. Um, cilia. No, cilia. they're not cilia. No? Um, lacteals. Huh. Are, are literally like, like, they're like tiny little sea anemones line the intestines <laughs> and they move around. And interestingly, they decide what's in the chyle that they want to take in. And they decide what they will reject and not take in, which is, I think, very important. Mm. And then once it passes through the small intestine, the lacteals have made their choice. Then it goes into the large intestine to extract water, and then it's kind of taken out of the body. Medically, when there is undigested food, let's say, uh, in poop and feces, that's a sign also that something is not breaking down. Uh, in the system and therefore cannot be assimilated. But feces itself is always the thing that could not be assimilated or perhaps should not be assimilated. Right. And I wonder uh, if it's sort of like this thing, whatever this battery represents, this this amount of energy or this potential it can't be assimilated yet because the ego is too narrow her sense of herself is too small. It can't contain that yet. It can't assimilate it. And that seems to be perhaps echoed in this other thing that happens in the dream where she's trying to get her things, but she can't find them. She can't claim her things. Or at least, you know, it's it's the way it's written. I'm not sure if that's happening in the dream or she mentions this just happens in other dreams. But there's this sense of not being able to take ownership of her own things. I'm thinking along a couple of lines. One of them is uh, the tie in with your incredible little educational module on the process <laughs> of digestion, Joseph. <laughs> and uh, that she is uh, consciously aware, paying attention to what she eats and how she eats that relates to this process of what can she metabolize uh, as she could not metabolize uh, what she found uh, on the floor of the kitchen in the form of poop. If I've been parsing out this dream, she says she wrapped it in a yellow garbage bag. So I'd like to go back to yellow, drops it in the garbage can. And then if then, if she does that, then she has to collect things strewn about the home in order to make a train journey. Then there's an aside about other dreams. And then she says, at another point, I was in a van with many people driving along a bumpy dirt road. So I'm just thinking that if she's at the house party and she picks up the poop with the batteries in it, then she has to go on some kind of a journey for which, in both cases, it's bumpy or she's not prepared. She doesn't have her things. And I think this relates to what uh, you guys have been saying uh, about, you know, where is her life going and what is not being taken in, in the sense that she feels too old and she's not certain. Nevertheless, the dream says she's traveling. Yeah, that's true. And now I kind of want to think about the yellow garbage bag because I've never seen any yellow garbage bags. Before we go to the garbage bag, just on what you were just saying, and in terms of assimilability, for the majority of the dream, I am surrounded by people, but I mm -hmm. feel alone. So what is she unable to assimilate interpersonally, which I think goes to attachment theory? Mm -hmm. or, or even interpsychically, too. Like she's sure. not feeling companioned on an inner level. It is not uncommon for people to go through a phase or to come into this life with an inability to metabolize goodwill, an inability or a block to metabolizing love, to attaching or feeling a, that people are attached to us. So there's something in the relational field that she's unable to be nourished by. And that it is at a deep unconscious level because the ego doesn't manipulate the lacteals. They're being, they're being worked by some other primordial intelligence in the psychoid layer of the unconscious. 
So whatever this is that's going on, both in her digestive tract, which is generally an assimilation issue, but also relationally, and she has the same feeling about her psychology degree and whether or not she's too old, can I digest all of this new information? So this, this work that needs to be done on this primordial level of absorbing and making use of, I think is being demonstrated, flagged in all these different worlds. But Deb, I, I, I want to come back to the yellow garbage bag. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, this may be a real reach, but I'm thinking that since Psyche has gone to the trouble of specifying a color, that I'm thinking about something solar and gold. And maybe that's, you know, sort of like, you know, that uh, the gold is always found in the, in the muck and in the mud. That's great, Deb. And in fact, um, the Aztecs believed that gold was the feces of the sun, Mm. which is a beautiful image. Like the sun shits out gold. (laughs) So So, yes, it is solar. And it's not a good choice uh, of a color if you're trying to hide something. (laughs) Yeah. Isn't this a great um, example of... uh, how psyche can just make itself known as like it's yellow, it's bright. <laughs> yeah. uh, the dream ego says, "Oh my God, I got to get rid of this." Mm-hmm. And some, the unconscious says, "I'm going to really uh, make it a good bright color to get your attention and specify s- something great could be going on here." You know, so I I think I kind of want to say to this dreamer, you know, go get that stuff out of the garbage can. Uh, Wash off those batteries. Yeah. I think also I I feel from having made a a big life change at about this age and working with people who are in their late 30s or early or mid 40s of what is this thing about I'm too old? You're not too old. Um, However, the feeling is a feeling of being raw and unprepared and can I do it and is it okay? Will I have the right stuff to encounter this next life challenge? You know, you're 39, you're going to be 40 anyway, or 45 or 50 anyway. Yeah. (laughs) So might as well go for it. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.